Okay, welcome everybody uh, to satellite navigation. And um, I've got a quite a nice small class today. I can't, can't you know, about 10 people or so in the class, which is super. So um, I'm very happy how you ask questions. Uh, if you want to, you can put your hand up uh, using the little Zoom device, but there's always a possibility I might miss that. Uh, and so I'm very, very comfortable if you just want to, to interject and to say, yeah, excuse me a second, what about that? So that we can have a proper conversation about this. Uh, my name's Alex Whittingham. I'm responsible for radio nav and performance uh, on this course. So you'll see me again when you come to do your revision courses. So we're looking at about an hour here, maybe an hour 20, an hour 30 to go through it. So what have we got to deal with? Well, um, we have four GNSS systems that we consider. Uh, strictly speaking, we only consider three of them for the old syllabus, but there's an addition of the Chinese Beidou, which is included in new syllabus exams. And all you need to do, as far as the Beidou is concerned, is recognize the name. So they'll say, which is the example of a GNSS system? And you just go, Beidou, it's that one. It's nice and nice and simple. The way we're going to approach this is we're going to look at the, the primary system, which is Navstar GPS, first of all, uh, to look at how the system operates, principles, operation, components, you know, all that sort of stuff. Um, and then once we've done that in depth, then we'll look at the other systems as required. The other systems are GLONASS, the former Soviet system, now the Russian system, and Galileo, the European system. Slight difference in treatment from the two syllabi. Uh, the old syllabus, we're required to make some statements about GLONASS and Galileo. The new syllabus, well, uh, we're not required to make the same statements, but there are, there are two statements that we need to make about GLONASS. So we'll, we'll deal with those separately when we come to them. So having looked at the principles operation and then looked at these other GNSS systems, we'll then start looking at uh, the, the various S buses and A buses and uh, G buses and things like that, come up with some definitions and talk about how the various systems work. So that's our plan for today. And we're gonna start off then by looking at the American system, which is properly called GPS Navstar, but everybody just calls it GPS. And this was a system developed in 1978 by the American military. And they use a service called the Precise Positioning Service, which gave them very accurate 3D positions, which in the late 1970s was a revolutionary thing because the nav systems that we have along in those days, even for airliners, would only position you within sort of three or 400 yards or so using our basic old RNAV principles. And they tootled along quite happily until the early 1980s. And then there was a, a rather unpleasant accident where a military airliner, sorry, a civil airliner was shot down by the military. It was not the first shoot down and it wasn't the last shoot down. Of course, there've been others since then. There's the USS Vincent, which shot down an Iranian Airbus. And recently, there's the Ukrainian aircraft that's been shot down flying out of Tehran. But at the time, it was a big thing because the Americans hadn't committed this particular cardinal sin. So they were very, very quick to, to lay blame on the Soviets. So a Korean airline 747, flight 007. And they had a lot of bad luck on this particular flight. Uh, their route was from Anchorage to Seoul. And uh, if you can see the image there, you can see the dotted line of their intended route and the solid line of their actual route. And you can see that they were basically off track for the entire flight. The reasons for this are not really known. There's a few suppositions. Um, they might, some people say it was an autopilot mess up. The pilots didn't select INS properly, so they were working on some form of heading steer. And other people say that they must have set up their inertial systems incorrectly. Uh, and you'll remember from the time when you did instruments that when you're setting up an old style inertial nav system, it goes through a sequence where it levels itself out. Um, and then you have to put in the latitude and longitude. It's got a fairly rough idea of what its latitude is, but not the slightest idea about its longitude. Uh, and that's a pilot input. And there's a suspicion that they put the wrong longitude in. But for whatever reason, they, they got it wrong and they were off track all the way. Um, second bit of bad luck is their track took them out over the Bering Sea where there was nothing in the way of civilian radars. So the civilian radars didn't notice them going off track. Um, third bit of bad luck was the particular airspace that they were flying over is contested airspace or was then contested airspace between the Soviet Union and the Americans. And the Americans have bases in the Aleutian Islands where they use electronic surveillance gathering 
707 variants called EC-135s, and they probe into Russian airspace just the same way that the Russians probe into, into American airspace and into NATO airspace. So the Russians were quite lively to the idea of four-engine Boeings coming in and quite sensitive about it. And basically, they flew over the Kamchatka kaminsk Peninsula, deep into Russian airspace, and in the end, the aircraft was shot down, and just short of 300 people lost their lives. And in the aftermath, the president of the day, who I think might have been Ronald Reagan, said, well, we actually have this rather good navigation system that we can release to civilian use, uh, but we're going to do it in a, in a degraded way so that you don't have the same sort of accuracy as the American military have. They have a, a degraded system. And hence was born the Standard Positioning Service, which is what we use, what we use nowadays for GPS. And although it's come along a long way over the years in terms of accuracy, when it was first released to civilian use in the early 1980s, it was inherently less accurate than the military system and it had a device on it called selective availability in those days, which allowed the military to wind the accuracy up and wind the accuracy down entirely at their will. So what do we need to know? Well, everything that we're going to be talking about here is to do with the standard positioning service. Uh, there's a couple of small bits that relate to the PPS, um, and it might be the frequency, although that doesn't seem to be asked, and also the idea that ranging information is carried on both the precise positioning service and the standard positioning service. So let's look at how this GPS system actually works. And we start off by looking at a classification system, which the Americans have used, it's perfectly good, nothing wrong with it. And they say for classification purposes, the system is divided down into a space segment, a control segment, and a user segment. And they are essentially what they describe. The space segment is the stuff up in space, the control segment is the stuff on the ground that the American military and civil agencies use to control the GPS system. And the user segment is you, me, my wife's Volvo, that sort of stuff. Space segment first. Um, the space segment has a notional constellation of 24 satellites. Um, actually, there are quite a few more than that. There are more than 30 satellites up there. Um, but you're going to get tested about the notional constellation. And the reason for this is AASA got slightly ahead of themselves in the early days and started asking questions like, how many questions are there in the G how many satellites are there in the GPS space segment? And that question very rapidly went out of date as satellites failed, new satellites were launched. And so AASA pulled back their question asking to just talk about the notional constellations. And the notional constellation is the mathematical minimum that's required to make the system work. So 24 satellites in the notional constellation. They're in six near circular orbital planes. Now you might remember from earlier topics that there are things called um, geostationary orbits, where the satellite orbits around the equator and it orbits at exactly the same rate as the Earth rotates and therefore appears to stay stationary above the Earth. Geostationary orbits are no good for GPS. The reason why is that there are some parts of the Earth that a geostationary orbit cannot see. Anybody, which bits of the Earth would a satellite in a geostationary orbit not be able to see? The poles. The poles, absolutely right. And the satellites that we deal with that do use geostationary orbits, which are the Inmarsat communication satellites, that is a feature of them. You can't use satellite communications in the polar areas. So there's still a requirement for either VHF or HF communications where you're taking polar tracks. Now, this is a system designed to give global coverage. So the orbital planes can't be just equatorial. And what they are instead is they slash around the Earth at an angle like that. And we'll look at the, the constellation pictorially in just a second. What they don't do is they don't go straight over the poles. And there are reasons for this. The simplest reason is that if you did have them all going straight over the pole, then right over the top of the pole, there'd be satellites going And sooner or later, there'd be a poof, and little bits of satellite would fall onto the polar ice cap. So they're not polar orbits. And I raise that because there are questions which say, which of the following are correct? And one of the wrong answers 
is it says in six near circular polar orbits. Now, I found myself quickly reading the question and going, yeah, that's it. But I now have to force myself to look at the answer and say, does it say polar orbit? Because if it does, it's wrong. So six near circular orbital planes. And if you do the mass, 24 satellites, six orbital planes, then there must be at least four satellites in each plane. And the angle that they cross the equator at is 55 degrees. And by a quirk of mathematics, that means that the highest latitude the satellites actually pass right over the top of is 55 north. So once you go beyond 55 north, you're not actually going to have satellites going over the top. They're all going to be sort of lower down towards the horizon. Orbital height can be asked. Um, it's easier for us to think in terms of nautical miles, but in fact, you're going to be tested, if you are tested, on the height in kilometres. So the height to remember there is 20,200 kilometres. And whereas geostationary satellites necessarily take 24 hours in their orbit, these are much closer to the Earth. In fact, they're about half the distance to the Earth, and so the orbital period is about half the time. It takes about 12 hours. So that's our GPS space segment. And if you wanted to look at it pictorially, you'd be looking at a diagram something like this. Now, you can pick through that if you want to, because it looks like a skein of wool. But in fact, if you traced it through, you'd see that there actually are six defined orbits there. And each one of those orbits has got four satellites positioned in it. And you can see also that even though they don't actually go over the poles, the height that the satellites are operating at means that they have a clear view of the poles. So this is truly a global system. Although there might be some arguments about accuracy that derive from having the satellites go overhead you or not. So you might, for instance, find that the satellite fixing accuracy is less at the poles because the satellites are all sort of lower down and you can't get the ideal geometry. But we'll look at that in a sec. So while I was browsing through this, I found this neat little, whoops, this neat little GIF. Come on, GIF. Play. Oh, that is annoying. Well, that's a pity. That's meant to start up as an animation as soon as we get onto this slide. And it worked perfectly well before I walked into this room, and now it's not working at all. Um, however, the point about this is that somebody's gone to the trouble of looking at the GPS constellation of notional constellation of 24 satellites and plotting out a position somewhere in, in Texas or Arizona and working out mathematically how many satellites are visible at any particular time. And if this wretched GIF was operating, then what you'd see is the visible number of satellites goes up to eight or nine and down to five or six, but it very rarely goes below six. So the notional constellation will give you the number of satellites you need for a three-dimensional fix just with the 24 satellites. The other thing of note on this slide is the note next to it. It says calculated with a mask angle of five degrees above the horizon. What's a mask angle? Well, this is a system that works on timing, essentially. The satellite says, hi, my name's Fred, and it's 10 o'clock. Um, and if Fred is over there somewhere, then the satellite signal has to come from Fred to us, and we use the timing, how long it takes the signal to get to us, to work out where Fred is. There is something that interferes with this. The passage through the ionosphere and the atmosphere delays the signal. This is the single largest source of error with GPS, the ionospheric delay. And the biggest delays are going to happen when Fred is right down close to the horizon because he's going to signal's going to pass through the greatest bit of ionosphere and atmosphere. And so GPS receivers operate with this thing called a mask angle, which basically says I'm going to discount any satellite signals that are coming in, in this case, within five degrees of the horizon because they're going to be inherently unreliable signals having passed through the ionosphere over such a great distance. Now, this just happens to be calculated with a mask angle of five degrees. Five degrees is probably the lowest mask angle that you would use 
And it's not uncommon nowadays to have receivers that use mask angles of 20 degrees or 30 degrees to deselect satellites that might be perceived to be of poor value. And this is obviously something that you can do if you've got lots of satellites and something that you wouldn't do easily if you didn't have many satellites to look at. And there are receivers that will actually allow you to change the mask angle so that you can make your own judgments about the number of satellites you want to see versus the quality of information. Now, mask angle, curiously, is not actually something that's tested, but it still seems to creep into the theory behind it. So we might as well raise that directly now. What a pity that the animation didn't work. I'm just going to have one last go. No, nothing. Never mind. OK, so space segment then. Now looking at frequencies. Well. We've said that satellites send ranging signals. And according to our classification of frequencies, they would be operating on two UHF frequencies. But this is an American system. And the Americans don't always classify their frequencies the same way that we do in Europe. We say UHF, SHF, VHF, that sort of stuff. Nice decimal categorization. But the Americans, particularly the American military, give letter names to differently sized bands. So if you were to buy, for instance, a radar for your helicopter so from somewhere in America, it might be described as a KA radar or a K-band radar or something like that. And seeing as this is an American system, we have to use the American naming system as well as our own. And in American terminology, these frequencies would be described as L-band frequencies. So I've got two frequencies, I've got L1, operating on 1575 megahertz, and I've got L2 operating on 1227.6 megahertz. Do you need to remember the frequencies? Well, there have been questions that do have the frequency 1575 megs in them, but every question that I've seen, it's possible to answer the question without actually knowing the frequency. All you need to know is that L1 is the highest frequency, but having said that, the chances are the way memory works is you will all now remember that L1 is 1575 megs. So the precise code, which is another name for the precise positioning service or the P code, uses both L1 and L2 frequencies. Our standard positioning system, which is also known as the course acquisition code or CA, only uses the L1. So for our use, we use the higher of two frequencies, which is L1, which is 1575 megahertz. Now, actually, the names PPS and SPS are not really very often used. What they tend to say instead is the easier to say P code or CA or course acquisition signals. So if I was to summarize it the way it's most usually remembered, we'd say that the L1 frequency is the course acquisition code, which is used for civilian use, and the military precise codes. And L2 is the military precise codes only. So this raises a question. And the question is, why do the military use two frequencies when the civilians get by with just one frequency? And this goes back to that single largest source of error that I mentioned earlier the problem of ionospheric delay. Because it turns out that when you look at it, the ionospheric delay is proportional to one over the square of the carrier wave frequency. Now that means that if you have two frequencies, you can mathematically calculate out the ionospheric delay. That's why they use two frequencies. And that means that with us as a single frequency, we cannot mathematically calculate out the ionospheric delay. And so we need to have some other way of taking account of this ionospheric delay. Anybody recall how civilian users take account of ionospheric delay? What do we have access to? Isn't there some kind of model? Exactly right. That's the phrase that's used. It's a mathematical model of the ionosphere. So what happens when Fred says, hi, I'm Fred, and it's 10 o'clock, is we look at our position, and we look at Fred's position, 
and we work out from the ionospheric model how much ionosphere it's passed through and then apply a correction to it. That will take out about half of the ionospheric delay. So that's how, in the first instance, the American military made the civil use system on L1, the course acquisition code, inherently less accurate than their own two frequency system. But this tells us something because Jonathan's absolutely right. We do have a model of the ionosphere, but where did this model come from? I mean, it certainly wasn't in my Garmin when I bought it, so it must have arrived from somewhere. And the only place it can reasonably arrive from is from the satellites themselves. So this tells us that the satellites are not just saying, hi, my name's Fred and it's 10 o'clock, but they're also downloading data to our receivers. In this particular case, they're going to be downloading the more mathematical model of the ionosphere. And when we stop and think about it, they must be giving us other information as well. Because the concept was, uh, Fred says, hi, my name is Fred and I'm over here. And we say, this is where we are, this is where Fred is. But hang on a minute, how did we know where Fred is in the first place? Well, we need information about that. And that information is called the Almanac information, which is the course position of all of the satellites. So yet more data must be being downloaded to our GPS receiver. So there we go so far, we have an inherently inaccurate system. But this is a commercial world. Why hasn't somebody put up other satellites or other frequencies on the same satellites to allow civilian use? And the answer is they have. And EASA don't acknowledge this in either the old syllabus or new, but there are two frequencies that are second frequencies for civilian use so that we get more precise information and they're called L2C and L5 but not treated at all in these exams. So that's the space segment. Anybody got any questions on the space segment of what it is? Okay, next bit is the control segment. And as the name suggests, this is used by the Americans to control the operation of the satellites. And we're starting to get a feel for what this thing must be doing, because if the satellites have got data that they download to us, somebody has got to create this data and upload it to the satellites. And that's clearly going to be happening in the control segment. So the statement is that they contain monitor or reference stations. They contain master control station and an alternate, and its name suggests what it does. And also they have a series of ground antennae used for uplinking the data from the ground to the satellites. So first of all, a, a, a pictorial summary. This is... Um, a picture from uh, an American site, and it shows all the various elements of the GPS control segment around the world. And we don't need any detail of this at all, just the concepts of where they are. The first thing I want to talk about is the monitor stations. And those are shown as blue dots or purple dots. And you'll see that the monitor stations are relatively evenly separated around the land masses of the world. So they go right up to the far north in Alaska, and they go right down to New Zealand, Australia, and South Africa, and places like this. Briefly, the monitor station's job, we'll look at in more detail in a second, but the monitor station just sits there and downloads the information from the satellites. And then it sends all that information off to the master control station, which is the Red Star there, which is Shriver Air Force Base in, in Colorado. And in case of zombie attack, of course, there is an alternate, and the alternate is in Vandenberg Air Force Base in California. The other things we have um, are ground antennae. And the ground antennae are the green triangles. And you can see that those are more equatorial. Uh, this is because all satellites pass over the equatorial regions. And if you want to uplink, then that would be a good place to have an uplink station. And the other thing, just out of slight interest, is the uh, the acronyms at the bottom, because we would expect this to be an American Air Force system. But in fact, as we look around there, we find there are two more acronyms involved. AFSCN, uh, not tested, Air Force Satellite Control Network. And NGA, it's the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency. Who knew that such a thing existed? So what we've got here is a control segment that is, yes, it's Air Force, but there are also some other American government institutions involved in it. 
but mostly this is just for background information in detail. This is what a monitor station looks like. It's basically just a GPS receiver in a little, in a little or medium sized golf ball. They track the GPS satellites as they pass overhead. They collect the navigation signals, the range, the carrier wave measurements and the atmospheric data. And they pass all of that to the master control station. That's a monitor station. It's a basically a passive receiver. Then we have the master control station itself. <coughs> Excuse me. Provides command and control of the GPS constellation. It uses the monitor station data to compute the precise locations of the satellites. Generates the navigation messages for upload to the satellites. And we'll look at this in a second. Navigation message is actually the data message, the database that goes down. So slightly misleading term. So things like the almanac information, the course position of all the satellites, that's going to be created by the master control station and eventually uploaded to the satellites. Things like the ionospheric model, it comes from the master control station. Uh, monitor satellite broadcasts and system integrity to ensure constellation health and accuracy. And if a satellite goes mad, it's the master control station that says unhealthy. And we shall see in a minute, there's a binary marker that just goes healthy or unhealthy on the satellite. So when the receiver gets the information, it can tell whether it can rely on it or not. And finally, perform satellite maintenance, anomaly resolution, repositioning satellites in the orbits and all that sort of stuff. It does what you'd expect a control segment to do. And the third element is the ground antennae. And you remember these are broadly equatorial and these are uplink stations to the satellite. So satellites pass overhead and the data is uploaded from the ground antennae to the satellites. So sends commands and navigation data uploads to the satellites. And on the American website that describes this, they, say, they also say collect telemetry. So this is not entirely a transmit device, but I'm not really clear what telemetry is, but they say they collect it. So were we to summarize it with a pretty picture like that, we'd say the GPS control segment controls and updates transmitted data from the satellites. It updates the satellite ephemeris data. Hmm, there's a new word, ephemeris. Well, ephemeris comes from the same root as ephemeral, which means short term, fleeting in its existence. And we've already seen that the satellites will download almanac information to us, which is the course information about where the satellites are. But the almanac information is updated on a comparatively slow cycle. It's basically every 90 days or so it's updated. And the exact position of the satellites is very, very important to us. Because if a satellite whizzing through space was like a meter out in its position at a particular time, then that would have at least a meter's effect on our position. And we know that GPS nowadays achieves greater accuracy than that. In fact, if you were to look at the GPS accuracy nowadays, and you can do this, you look on the, on the, the GPS web pages, it'll tell you what the accuracy is in various places. What you would find is that raw GPS with a good receiver is going to give you a lateral accuracy of less than a meter, maybe 0.8 of a meter or something like that, and a vertical accuracy that is similar. So a very accurate system, excuse me. <coughs> Wasn't always that way. I mean, when this thing was first introduced, you used to get, when the accuracy was good, you used to get an accuracy of about 15 meters, but it's become more accurate over the years. So what is ephemeris? Well, if almanac is the course information about where the satellites are, the ephemeris information is the accurate information, the short-term fleeting information about the accuracy of that satellite. And it's transmitted by each individual satellite. So it says, hi, my name's Fred, and my ephemeris data is this. And we use that to work out the exact distance from Fred. Update cycles, not tested. Uh, but typically four hours or so to update the ephemeris, um, although they say it can be relied on for a number of days. And, and some of the, 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 the ground-based databases used for satellite prediction will, will have it valid for eight or nine days or stuff because they say it doesn't really change very much. But the actual ephemeris data is on a really short-term cycle. Update satellite clock error data. Well, this is a problem 
because the way we're going to work out how long it's taken the signal to get to us is Fred is going to say, hi, my name's Fred and it's 10 o'clock. And we're going to look at our watch and say, it's not 10 o'clock, it's one second past 10. Goodness me, that means the signal has taken a second to reach us at the speed of light. And as we know, the speed of light is 162,000 miles a second. That means Fred is 162,000 miles away. Well, he clearly isn't 162,000 miles away because the orbital height is only 11,000 miles or so. So the time intervals that we're talking about here are very, very small indeed. Um, a thousandth of a second, for instance, equates to 162 miles of range. And that means the clocks measuring these times must be mega, mega accurate. The satellites have four atomic clocks in them, all having a vote about the time. And they are monitored by the ground station and they're updated. But if there is an error, we need to know about it. And this is what the control segment is going to do. It's going to say, this is the clock error on this particular satellite. It's out by, I don't know what it is, a nanosecond or something like that. And finally, it monitors the satellite status for malfunctions and it gives malfunctioning satellites this unhealthy marker so that the receivers know not to rely on that information. Any questions so far? So we've done the space segment, we've done the control segment. The next thing we need to look at is the user segment, which is you, me, etc. Now in terms of receivers, there's a wide variety of receivers. Um, a decent aviation receiver should give you the sort of accuracy that you're talking about, you know, one to two meters in three dimensions. A mobile phone will give you an accuracy of about three to four meters. So part of the accuracy you get is the, is the quality of your receiver. Round about here is a turn of the century um, aircraft type GPS. And we need to be able to say that this is a multi-channel receiver. There were receivers in the early days which were multiplex. Multiplex means that you have one line of information coming in. You take a bit of data from this satellite, stop. Take a little bit of data from that satellite, stop. Take a bit of data from that satellite, stop. And that means that inherently you haven't got simultaneous navigation information. A multi-channel receiver means it can receive information from multiple satellites on multiple channels. And a typical modern aviation receiver will have somewhere between two to 400 channels. So it's not going to be maxed out by the satellites that are available. And what this is going to provide us ultimately is a three dimensional position fix and speed data and also precise time reference. And we'll look at each of these pieces of information in turn, starting with computing speed. Now, the simplest way to compute speed is to measure distance traveled against time. I was here, I'm here, I'm here. Distance, 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 time gives me speed. So the simplest receivers will work out your ground speed in that context. And that will give you a ground speed that's accurate to meters a second. But this is not the only path. More complex receivers will take a Doppler shift on the L1 carrier wave. And then they'll compute out the three-dimensional movement of the satellites. And what you're left with is going to be the receiver velocity, accurate to centimeters a second. Now, just occasionally, I come across a piece of technology and I just go, wow. And when you think about what's involved in this Doppler shift method, for me, it's a wow. A very weak signal coming in from the satellites. Remember that they're powered by batteries and solar panels. So we've got this very weak signal coming from 10, 12, 15,000 miles away through space, through the ionosphere. And first of all, we detect a Doppler shift on it. Then we can do the maths to take out the movement of satellites going whoosh, whoosh, whoosh around the Earth so fast that they complete a complete orbit in 12 hours. And what you're left with is an accuracy of centimeters a second. Just wow. So that's the user segment computing speed. And while we're there, we should make a statement about the position of the aerials on an aircraft. And the statement is that they're positioned on the upper surface of the aircraft, close to the center of gravity. The first part of this 
is in the category blindingly obvious. Why would we put the GPS aerials on the top of the aircraft? To reflection in hyperspace. It's where the satellites are, isn't it? There's no point putting them under the wings because the satellites aren't going to get the signals to the aircraft. And close to the center of gravity? What do you think about that? What would be the possible failing if we put the GPS aerial, for instance, on the left wing tip? So, you know, basically, that's our center position. It's the center position. The aircraft maneuvers around the center of gravity. So, if, yeah. yeah. So, if you put it out on the wing tip, if you were doing a, a, an RNP approach and you bank the aircraft, then it would say, oh, that's the height of the aircraft. It would give you an erroneous reading for the height of the aircraft. So this is all common sense. And that's a, a retrofitted aerial on a 737. It's uh, station 500A, which is not center of gravity. You'll know from mass and balance, the center of gravity obviously is somewhere in the mean aerodynamic cord, but it's pretty close to it. That's our user segment. Anything on that? So now what we need to do is to look in a little bit more detail at the information that is sent down by the satellites. And we will run against a diagram which on the face of it looks very intimidating, but when you pick it to a piece it actually makes perfect sense. So this is the diagram. And uh, we'll see, first of all, that the signal comes in on the L1 frequency. So there it is coming in on L1, and it splits into two elements. There's the thing called the PRN code, and there's a thing called the nav message. So let's look at the PRN code first of all. And coming out of the PRN code are two things, the satellite identifier and the timing signal. So basically the PRN code is saying, hi, my name's Fred and it's 10 o'clock. Now you may remember from radio nav how these PRN codes, this is radio nav, uh, how these PRN codes might be generated. And I have a little diagram down the bottom for your delectation. Uh, what it shows there is the binary PRN code coming in there. Underneath it, there's the L1 carrier wave, and the binary code is imposed onto the carrier wave using a binary phase shift keying, where every time the, st the, the status changes from a one to a zero, you can see that the phase reverses. So that's the signal that actually comes out. Repeated every millisecond. So why do we call it a PRN code, a pseudo random noise code? Well, that's because the algorithm that's used to generate it looks very much like the algorithm that you would use to generate pseudo random noise, uh, random noise. And so some WAG has labeled these types of codes pseudo random noise codes, but they're not random. They contain a cycle of very precise codes that says, my name is Fred, and this is the time. And it repeats every thousandth of a second. Think about it, a thousandth of a second in terms of distance means it's 162 miles long from the very beginning of the PRN code cycle to the very end, because it's traveling, of course, at the speed of light. So what's the related problems with this? Well, one of the related problems with this is that the signal itself is very, very weak. And if we looked at it compared to the background noise, then we'd find that the background noise is actually quite difficult to separate out from the PRN code. How can you tell that those peaks are the peaks of a PRN code and not just peaks in the random noise? And that's one of the reasons why it has to be so long. If you just sent a couple of pulses, you, you wouldn't be able to tell, but because it's a long pattern, then it can be decoded at the receiver and matched to the PRN code that the receiver is expecting from that satellite and say, oh yes, that's Fred. But this Weakness of signal creates one of the biggest weaknesses of GPS, and that is it's startlingly easy to jam. All you have to do is to nip down to Tandy's, get yourself $30 worth of electronics, and start broadcasting white noise in the UHF band, raise the noise level up like that, and your satellite signal is now completely invisible. And, and everybody knows this. I mean, if you happen to be engaged in a war with the American forces, and you wanted your leader in his Toyota Land Cruiser not to be targeted by inertial, by um, GPS targeted weapons, then you could set up in the market square a little GPS jammer and the GPS targeting systems won't work. The military know this, so they routinely practice their operations 
with GPS jamming in place. And if you look, you'll find NOTAMs that say GPS is unavailable, perhaps in the North North Sea or the Baltic area or something like that because of NATO exercises, NOTAM doubt. And you'll also find NOTAMs that talk about irregular jamming, shall I say, and also spoofing where spoof messages are sent, uh, the raw GPS is jammed and the spoof messages are sent. And an area where that happens a lot is in the Eastern Mediterranean south of Turkey, near Lebanon, Syria, and stuff like that, you cannot necessarily rely on your GPS in that part of the world because they will jam you, they will spoof you. So a fundamental weakness of the system, it's easily spoofed, easily jammed. So that's the PRN code then. It basically is saying, my name's Fred and it's 10 o'clock. Any questions on the PRN code? Now we're gonna look at the NAV code and I'm gonna expand that diagram up to see the various elements of the NAV code. And as I said, at the first sight, really quite intimidating. But in fact, we've come across some of these before. There's a basic need for some of this information. For instance, the almanac information. If we're going to say, well, Fred's over there, we need to know where Fred is. So this is our course position of all of the satellites held in the receiver all the time, downloaded from the satellites themselves, and updated on a comparatively long cycle, two, three months, that sort of cycle. Underneath that, we've got the ephemeris information, which is specific to the satellite and is saying, actually, you know roughly where I am. This is precisely where I am. And then you can use that to calculate the precise distance. Alex? Yeah. So just on that, how does the satellite know where it is? Where does that ephemeris position come from? It has to be uploaded from the ground because that's the role of the monitoring stations. Now, I was desperately hoping that nobody was going to ask me about the ephemeris information because I've tried to work out from the internet exactly how it works. And it seemed to me at the starting point that the ephemeris information was going to be a series of deltas, that it would say, OK, this is where the almanac is, but I'm actually up a bit, left a bit, right a bit and stuff like that. But in fact, it turns out that the ephemeris information is a series of standard deviations of velocity vectors. And at that point, I started to overload my brain and, and I thought I'm not actually going to get anywhere with this. Uh, but it has to come from the ground station. It has to come from the monitor stations. They have, to, they have to detect exactly where the satellites are. That goes back to the control station. The ephemeris is computed. The ephemeris is uploaded on this cycle, this four hour cycle to the satellites and each individual satellite then downloads it again. OK, thank you. Has to be that way. So underneath ephemeris, we've got satellite clock correction, which we've already commented on, that the whole thing relies on mega accurate timing. Oh dear, I've got an exam next door and they say, Matt says they can hear us clearly next door. I'm gonna to have to try and keep the volume down. Um, they relies on mega accurate timing. So that's the satellite clock correction. And then we've got UTC correction. Um, determines the difference between GPS time and UTC. And curiously, the satellite constellation doesn't work on UTC. The satellite constellation works on a time base called GPS time. And the main difference between these two is that the UTC has got um, leap seconds in it and GPS doesn't. So every time a leap second is introduced, the two time bases go out of sync by a second. And last time I looked, it was about 15 seconds or something like that difference between UTC and GPS. So the whole internal software system is going to work on GPS time. And what do we need the UTC correction time for? Because when we display it to the pilot, or when the receiver displays it to the pilot, it needs to display it as UTC. Now, you might not think 15 seconds is very much, but you know, 15 seconds is 15 seconds. So given that we've got this time correction, it's downloaded to you, and it changes rarely. Underneath that, there's the ionospheric model, which we've already identified a need for, so that we don't need to operate on two frequencies. And underneath that is the satellite health status. So actually, when you pick through the various elements of the navigation message, then you can understand perhaps why all of this information is there. Back to the previous slide for a second. There's something on here that need to look at, and that is that thing in a little barrel shaped um, marker there. It says 25 data frames at 30 seconds. 
Well, what we've got here is a lot of information. And if we were to download it linearly, it would take 12 and a half minutes to download. And the problem here is that the satellite might not be in view for 12 and a half minutes. And if you've ever tried to download a database and it's gone wrong, you'll know how frustrating this could be. Starting database download, download interrupted. Restarting database download, download interrupted. Restart, you can imagine what it was gonna be like. So the obvious solution to this is to take our 12 and a half minutes of linear data and put it into chunks of information. So that means that satellite goes over the top, we download a chunk, download a chunk, download a chunk. Next satellite goes over the top, download a chunk, download a chunk. So these chunks of data are constantly being updated in our, in our receiver database from the satellites generally as they pass over the top. Question here would be, if you were to take a complete linear download on the navigation message, how long would it take? 12 and a half minutes. So there's our nav message at the end. Any questions on the PRN code or the nav message? Not a sausage. Right, now we need to look at how the system works. And we've sort of got the idea of it already, but Fred's gonna say, my name's Fred and it's 10 o'clock. We're gonna look at our watch. We're gonna work out a range. Let's see if there might be some issues with that. So we need to start off with us. So I'm gonna put myself in this little jet down at the bottom of the screen my GPS receiver is where the red dot is in the middle of it. And there's Fred. And Fred says, 10 o'clock. We look at our watch. We look at the time delay between when Fred sent it and when it arrives, and we calculate a range. And here we run into our next problem. But although Fred has got four atomic clocks in him, having a vote about the time, and when Fred says it's 10 o'clock, it pretty much is 10 o'clock, your little Garmin, does not have an atomic clock in it. You'd know about it if it did. What it has instead is an electronic clock. Now, given that a thousandth of a second equals 162 miles of range error, and a millionth of a second equals 0.162 miles range error, even if you're going for 0.162 miles, which is nowhere near GPS levels of accuracy, would you be prepared to bet that the electronic clock in your Garmin is accurate to a millionth of a second. What do you think? Bet? No, no bet? No. no bet, no. So we've got a problem here that is the, the measurement of the time delay is going to be out because of the receiver clock error. And that means that it's absolutely inevitable that when we first measure the range from Fred, there's an error in it. And that range is known as a pseudo range because it's something that pretends to be a range, but isn't. So that's our first pseudo range from Fred. Never mind. Another satellite up there, she says, hi, my name is Martha. And it's four seconds past 10. We look at our clocks, we work out a range from Martha, but because of this receiver clock error, we're gonna have exactly the same range error from Martha. So that plots in there. Other one pops up there, says, hi, my name is Joe, and we calculate a range from Joe, and because of the receiver clock error, we're gonna have exactly the same range error. So it's absolutely inevitable that our first attempt to fix our position is going to, at least in two dimensions, give us this large triangular area of uncertainty where we could be somewhere in there. Or maybe not, as it turns out, because you can see that we're not in there. So how are we gonna deal with that? Well, we can deal with that, very easily, actually, as it happens. What we do is we make a correction to the satellite receiver timing and say, let's try a small correction and see what happens to that range uncertainty. So there's a small correction. And the question now is, has it got better? Now, by got better, what I mean here is not has the triangle got closer to us because we don't know where we are. I mean, has the triangle got smaller? If it got bigger, we clearly need to make a timing correction in the other way. But in this case, the triangle has got smaller. Good. So we do it again. Got better? Yes. Good. Let's do it again. Got better? Yes. Let's do it again. And this is called an iterative process, a series of small steps. Let's do it again. Let's do it again. 
and you can see that the position is trending down, ideally to a pinpoint fix like that. And what would happen, of course, is that it would then make another correction, go out over the other side and come back. So this receiver clock error is constantly being applied and the pseudo ranges are constantly being adjusted to get the closest thing to a pinpoint fix that you can get. But what that means is using this iterative process, we don't actually need to have three atomic clocks in our Garmin. We can get by with an electronic clock and apply this correction to find out our pinpoint position. And that means that once this exercise is complete, not only will we have latitude, longitude, and height, but because we now know what the correction is to apply to the satellite clocks, so we now have a receiver clock correction that gives us a very accurate time as well. So we get latitude, longitude, height, and time. Now, I've done this on a flat surface, and so I've used three satellites to get my position. But let's suppose I was operating in three dimensions. How many satellites minimum would I need to get a three-dimensional position? Four. Four, excellent. So in summary then, there's a pretty picture that shows the satellites and the receiver clock error corrected for. A 2D fix needs three satellites. A 3D fix needs four satellites. And each range defines a sphere with the satellite at its center. So I showed them as circles, but they are in fact spheres. So what have we done in words? We compute a 3D position fix comprising latitude, longitude, altitude, and time. And the inclusion of time means that you can call it a four-dimensional fix, um, perhaps, but they do sometimes in exams call it a four-dimensional fix. Look at the words underneath. Using trilateration, there's a new word. Well, I knew what triangulation was because that was done in geometry at school and with maps and stuff like that. And that's where you get three angles that intersect at a point, like three VOR bearings, and that tells you where you are. So what on earth is trilateration? Well, strictly from the Latin, it means three sides. So these are three intersecting planes giving you a position fix. In fact, there are not three intersection planes because you guys have just told me that I need a minimum of four satellites, four spheres of position to give me a three-dimensional position fix. So if we're being really picky about this, we'd have to make up a word that would be something like quadrilateration. But quadrilateration is not something that mathematicians understand. So the word trilateration is applied to this. It means planes or surfaces intersecting rather than lines. Correcting pseudo ranges, we know why they're called pseudo ranges, for receiver clock bias, we know how they do that, and referencing position to our old friend WGS84. Any questions there? So we mentioned the ideal geometry for four satellites in a position fix earlier on. And we mentioned that we may have problems in the polar areas because the satellites just don't pass overhead. We just see them coming up and going <laughs> over the horizon like that. To understand the ideal geometry, you need to know a little bit about medieval and Iron Age war warfare, a device called a caltrop. There is a caltrop. Um, a caltrop is a vicious steel device uh, made up of one, two, three, four prongs with barbs on them that is completely symmetrical in three dimensions. And the idea was, it was used by the Romans, caltrops. The idea was if your barbarian cavalry were about to charge, you scatter the caltrops out in front of your troops. And however they land, there's always going to be a spike pointing upwards, which will go into the soft part of the poor horse's hooves and disturb the charge. So there's a caltrop. Now, if you imagine us being at the central point where all those forearms together, that is the ideal symmetrical geometry to have four satellites positioned around us. But the problem is that if we were to go for that geometry, uh, then three of the satellites would be down there below the horizon. And we clearly can't see them below the horizon. So we have to take this and modify it and say three satellites just above the horizon, separated by 120 degrees, so one there, one there and one there, and one directly overhead. That's our 
notional ideal geometry taking account of the Earth's surface. So while we're here, let's consider rain. We looked at this concept before and we saw that we have three satellites, we have our pseudo ranges, and we correct for the pseudo ranges and it brings the triangle down to a minimum and that's constantly happening. But let's suppose that one of those satellites went mad. Let's suppose that Joe out there on the right suddenly went nuts. And for whatever reason, the range that he's given us is now in error. The problem we have is that our receiver doesn't know anything about the state of madness of Joe. Oh, well, we will eventually, because eventually Joe will pass over a monitor station and his information will be downloaded, and it'll go to the, the, the master control station at Vandenberg Air Force Base or whatever, and then it'll say, goodness me, Joe's gone mad. And then they'll put an unhealthy marker on it, and then it'll go to a ground link station, and the next time the satellite passes over this ground link station, it'll be uploaded, and Joe will have an unhealthy tag on his data from that point onwards. But they say that this entire process can take up to three hours. So that means for that whole three hour period, a satellite Joe over there is going to be putting out spurious information. And when we run the process, the iterative process, what's going to happen is we're going to get a position that is in error like that. So we really need a system that can identify Joe's lunacy. And this is what we call RAIM, Receiver Autonomous Integrity Monitoring which is what it says. The receiver is autonomously on its own, monitoring the integrity of the data. Well, how do we do that? Well, we said earlier, we needed four satellites to get a three-dimensional fix. RAIM uses a minimum of five satellites, but only four are used for the navigation solution. And one is kept as a spare. And every 20 seconds or so, what will happen is that one of the satellites will be kicked out of the navigation solution and the spare will be pulled in. Now, if you consider what's happening on the slide here, when we kick Joe out of the navigation solution, our position is going to jump back to the real position. When we pull Joe back in again, our position is going to jump to this one. So it's comparatively easy to find out which satellite is causing your position to jump, which satellite of the five. And that means that you can identify it as giving you defective information. This is the operation of RAIN. Questions on the principle? So in words, it operates in the receiver. For a three-dimensional solution, it uses four satellites for fixing, and the fifth is operating as a spare. And then it goes through this process of pulling the spare into the solution and make one of the others that's actually working the spare. And if the position jumps, then we've got a defective satellite. So what RAIM is going to be used for by us is it's going to give us the required integrity control for GNSS operation. When our receiver says, yes, RAIM is operating, that means that we can have some confidence in the position fix. And there is a requirement, which is not tested, that RAIM prediction should be checked at the pre-flight stage to ensure that you have it for all but perhaps a certain time interval on your flight. It might be five minutes, or in some cases, it might be 20 minutes. It depends on the sort of route you're doing, what sort of RMP procedures and things like that. There are two standards of RAIM called FD and FDE, fault detection and fault detection and exclusion. Fault detection is what I've described so far. It uses one spare satellite. So if the satellite solution fails, if one of the satellite fails, it can say, yep, you're out of it. But as soon as that happens, we've gone down from having five satellites to four, and that means we no longer have RAIM functioning. So that's not an ideal thing, because it means we just get a it's failed message, not it's failed and we can continue to have confidence in the GPS solution. If we wanted that, we'd have to have one extra satellite, at least, so we had a spare, spare, so two plus spares, and this is a standard called fault detection and exclusion. And it means that if you have a satellite failure, you can exclude Joe the satellite, but you've still got five satellites left, so at least you're going to get fault detection. And in fact, if you had three, four spares available, then you would still operate on fault detection and exclusion. Now, there are some exam questions which don't have particularly good answers here, 
the learning objective says this, that state that basic RAIN requires five satellites, a sixth is required for isolating a faulty satellite from the navigation solution. And what it doesn't say, and what it should say is, and continuing to offer RAIN. That's the important part at the end of that learning objective that's left out because fault detection, when you have a faulty satellite, it just goes faulty satellite, thank you much, goodbye. And you don't have GPS anymore. Whereas fault detection exclusion, faulty satellite, yep, and I'm still offering you RAIN. In numbers then, it works out quite well. So you told me a two-dimensional fix, unmonitored needs three satellites. If I want basic RAIN fault detection, it's four, five. So it goes 2D fix, three, four, five, 3D fix, four, five, six. What could be easier to remember? And we're required to say that if barometric altitude is an input, the number of satellites required may be reduced by one. Because of course, barometric altitude as an input is defining a sphere of position above the surface of the earth. Now, not all altimeter systems allow you to input barometric altitude because they're not accurate enough. So if you're flying around in a Seneca or something like that, you couldn't use barometric altitude as an input. Questions on RAIN? Definition for you. And this is a definition that is back plotted from an exam question. So we don't know where the definition came from. Um, it's just a thing you need to be able to say. In relation to the satellite navigation system, all in view is a term used when a receiver is tracking all currently visible satellites above the receiver's mask angle and uses them to compute the position. Don't know where they got it from. If you look on the internet, there are loads of different definitions for all in view, and none of them I found include this, but it's a, an answer to a question. So that basically covers our, our principle of operation and covers RAIM. And what we need to do now is to look at uh, the system errors, and then we're gonna go on and look at SBAS and GBAS and stuff like that. But before we do, has anybody got any questions about system operation, anything you wanna talk about? Okay, so here's a list of system errors. I'm just gonna pop them out because we probably know most of them. Um, at the top, the biggest, ionospheric propagation delay. Satellite clock error, yep. Satellite orbital variations, well, yes, satellite orbital variations will eventually be picked up by the monitor stations, but we've got this problem, this three hour window, uh, or maximum three hour window, where it takes time for the corrections to be uploaded. Multipath signals, these are reflected signals causing confusion. And finally, something that we need to define more closely, dilution of position. So in turn, ionospheric propagation delay, the most significant error. And we've seen how it can be overcome. It can be overcome by the ionospheric model in the nav signal, and that takes about 50% of the error out of it. Or if you're lucky enough to have two frequencies, you can almost eliminate this largest, most significant error. Satellite clock error. Ultimately, it's going to be corrected by the master control station. But we've noticed that it can be separately identified by RAIM, by the receiver itself, um, if it doesn't do anything about it other than fix your position so you don't rely on the unhealthy satellite, uh, whereas the top one will actually correct the clock. Satellite orbital variations. We need to make a statement that they're caused by solar wind and gravitational effects of the sun, moon, and planets. Again, will be picked up by the monitor stations and corrections can be made to the orbit. All of this is discovered already or comparatively common sense. But here's one we haven't considered, multipath signals. Now I used to scoff at this because I figured that what AESA had done is they'd looked on a generic GPS website and they'd seen cartoon pictures of Japanese teenagers wandering around downtown Tokyo with the signals being reflected from tall buildings and interfering with their iPhone position. And I said, very well, and we understand that, but how is this going to affect us? Because we're in aeroplanes at 30,000 feet. There's not going to be any multipath stuff between us. And then I took my 14-year-old son skiing a couple of years ago, pre-COVID, and I found myself driving down a valley near Chamonix. And you know when you, you have your GPS up on the car, and when you come to a roundabout junction, the, the car on the, on the image actually is at the roundabout junction. I mean, like every time. 
Well, I came up to this roundabout near Chamonix and the car wasn't there. It was about 15 yards away. And I looked at it and thought, that's very odd. And then I thought, multipath signals. What's happening here is the signals are being reflected from the sides of the valley here and they're interfering with my GPS position. This is how I spend my holidays. And then if you read that across to aeroplanes, well, yeah, the aer this is a picture of Innsbruck. And so any aeroplane operating in that sort of area is going to potentially be affected by multipath signals. And what about helicopters? I mean, helicopters going down glacial valleys and things like that, they're going to be affected by multipath signals as well. So it's a valid error caused by reflections from surfaces near the receiver. But I think we'd have to tag onto that if we we're being sensible about it, that it's particularly a problem at low level in mountainous terrain. We wouldn't expect it to happen at 30,000 feet. Anything on multipath signals? Now we get to dilution of position. Dilution of position arises from the geometry and number of satellites in view. So we've looked at our, our Caltrop as the perfect arrangement, and we've acknowledged that we don't always get the perfect arrangement because the closer you get to the poles, the less likely you are to have a satellite in the overhead, and all your satellites are going to be down near the horizon. So although you may have lots of satellites in view, you're not going to get a very good fix out of them because they're all going to cut at a very, very shallow angle. So this is dilution of position. And it's expressed in numerical terms. You can get a predicted dilution of position, which is called a PDOP, and it gives a numerical value. And low numbers are good, high numbers are bad. Now, on the right-hand side of this slide, I've got the predicted dilution of position for some areas in Asia. And you can see the sort of numbers you get there. So Beijing is going to be uh, a mean of about two. So we're going to get a good DOP in Beijing. And you can see the variation from the minimum to the maximum. In fact, all of those areas pretty much give you a good DOP score, a good predicted DOP score. You'll also see that on the top of that, they call it GDOP. So this is another acronym which means the same thing, and it means geometric dilution of position. Excuse me. <coughs> so um, when we look at the possible errors that could come out of a satellite system, we're going to have all the residual errors that are left after attempting to correct for ionospheric delay and satellite clock error and stuff like that. There's always going to be something left. And we're also going to have to consider the geometry of satellites, the PDOP. And when we look at the arrangement of the number of satellites you can see and the PDOP, you get these interesting graphics. And these are here mostly for information. Actually, I'll take that, 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 that magnifier off. So what we've got here on the top line is GPS satellite constellation. And in the bottom line, we've got images of the Galileo constellation. And um, we have two mask angles there. The left-hand column gives us a mask angle of five degrees. So, sorry, the right, the, the left-hand column gives us a mask angle of 10 degrees, I beg your pardon. And the right-hand column gives you a mask angle of five degrees. And the intensity of color there is the number of satellites that are visible in, in those two left-hand columns. And you can see that raising the mask angle to 10 degrees makes a significant difference, particularly if you look at the GPS line like that. And you will see that, as you might expect, in the polar regions, you can see lots of satellites. And also, in the equatorial regions, you can see lots of satellites. So you get these three bands of high visibility, really, at the poles, one, two poles, and at the equator. But when you look at the right-hand column, this is the predicted dilution of precision with a mask angle of five degrees in this particular case. You can see that the numbers are below two, right the way up to about, what's that, about 60 north, something like that. It's all sort of dark blue. And the Galileo, similar sort of areas. So anywhere between 60 north and 60 south, unless there's something very odd going on, you can expect a good DOP score. Now, the reason I flash this up is in new syllabus, um, there has been some suggestion that there's been a question asking where the most, where on the Earth most satellites are visible. And I just can't answer that because without numerical values, I can't distinguish between the number of satellites visible at the equator and the number of satellites visible at the pole. But um, I don't know how that, if it comes up, you have to do the best you can. But I'd be interested in the, the exact question if it comes back. 
So that's DOP and satellite visibility. Any questions there or comments? Okay, so we talked about two elements. We said there's the residual errors from ionospheric delay and stuff like that, and clock error and stuff. And those residual errors have a name. They're called UERE, the user equivalent range error. It's all the residual errors affecting the receiver position after attempts have been made to compensate them and specifically not including the dilution of position score. So that means that we have two things that we can take together. We can add together the UERE and the GDOP, and that's basically going to give us a total position error. In fact, it's more complicated than that. And the mathematical whizzes amongst you will be looking for standard deviations of position error, which is achieved by taking standard deviations of UERE, multiplying them by standard deviations of GDOP, and on we go. But in simple conceptual terms, the total position error is a combination of the residual errors in the receivers which have not been successfully corrected and the dilution of position. Any questions on the use of those two terms? UERE is in the old syllabus, but I don't know of any questions relating to it. It is in the new syllabus, and they do ask questions about it, specifically that third bullet point. Questions from the floor or comments? Okay, so those are all of our various errors and how they totalize up into user equivalent range error and dilution of position. Uh, what we need to do now, uh, before we finish with the basic concepts of GPS, is to look back at a statement that I made earlier on, which is when the Americans first set this system up, they made it inherently less accurate. And they also included the ability to turn the accuracy up and down at will. We've seen how they make it inherently less accurate. They just gave us a single frequency. So we had to have some other method of taking out the ionospheric delay. But how did they turn the accuracy up and down? This is a thing called selective availability. Now, selective availability has actually allegedly, whoops, allegedly been completely withdrawn, but it's still as a concept still in our syllabus. Um, how does it do it? it? It offsets the satellite clock with a pattern of dithering. It goes like this with its time. And the idea is that the military users know what the pattern of dithering is, so they can compensate for it. Whereas the civilian users don't know what the pattern of dithering is, so it means the error that on range is something that the American military can control. Um, since 2000, they say that selective availability has been set to zero. But the man that said that was Bill Clinton. And so he doesn't always completely, well, he's always fairly literal with the truth, depending on what you mean that woman is. But that's what he said anyway, set to zero. And they say that new satellites have no ability to use selective capability. Whether you believe that um, is up to you entirely. But those are the statements that are coming out from America. And that's what we test. Any questions on that? OK, so now alternative systems. New syllabus, very little is required. A couple of statements and just know the names of them. Old syllabus, a little bit more. So GLONASS differences for the old syllabus. There's a fair bit in the training material on this because there's a fair bit actually in the syllabus. But they've known that the changes were coming, old syllabus to new, for some time. And they've said, we're just not going to ask any questions about this, any new questions about this. So we know what the GLONASS questions are, and we can tie it down fairly easily. So here's one page of differences for the old exam. Um, the satellites are arranged differently. There are 24 satellites arranged in three orbital planes. And if you do the maths on that, 3, 8 to 24, that means each orbit must have eight satellites in it. The height is lower. Do you need to know what the lower height is? I think probably not. Just to be able to say lower will get you through most of those questions. And because it's lower and closer to the Earth's surface, it has a faster orbit. Again, don't think you need to know the time. You just need to be able to say lower and faster. And most important point for in terms of exam questions, it uses a different geodetic reference system. It uses a system called the PZ90 
earth-centered, earth-fixed position datum. Excuse me. <coughs> you don't need to know what it is, but it's actually self-describing. Do you remember that G WGS84 is an ellipsoid? What this is, it starts from a, a center point on the earth where they define it, and then they use Cartesian coordinates to describe where everybody is in terms of three-dimensional position from there. But all we need for the exam is to recognize PZ90. Tick, thank you very much, walk away. Modern exam, shouldn't need it. New syllabus statements. Two statements. Agreements have been con concluded between the appropriate agencies for the compatibility and interoperability by any approved user of Navstar and GLONASS systems. And the different GMSSs use different data with respect to reference systems, orbital data, and NAV services. So different data certainly for navigation services, but the top statement, agreements have been concluded for interoperability, doesn't actually mean that they are interoperable. It just means they've agreed, concluded agreements about it. Um, and I think what has happened is the AESA examiners have assumed that the conclusion of these agreements mean that the two systems are interoperable. Um, I'm not entirely sure that that's correct. I can't find any authoritative statements anywhere that say they're interoperable. They talk about Galileo being interoperable with, with GPS, but I can't find anything that says this interoperability has been achieved. And it's not a casual definition, interoperability. When you look on the net, you'll find that there's a system interoperability, there's a data interoperability, there's all sorts of different standards to meet. But there is a question in the new syllabus, and I think the correct answer is that Navstar and GLONASS are interoperable, but they use different navigation services. But that's just based on an assumption that the examiners have read that learning objective quite lightly and haven't actually questioned it in any depth. New syllabus, guys, any questions on that? Just for fun, that's the image. So three orbital paths, you remember, um, and three eights, 24, so eight satellites in each particular orbital path. Any questions on GLONASS? Galileo. Um, the old syllabus, they used to ask a fair bit about Galileo because, of course, it's a European system and there's a, a web page on the European Space Agency which discusses it. Uh, new syllabus, I haven't actually had any Galileo questions, but you never really know. that They tend to, so sometimes they take questions which really aren't in the syllabus and say, well, that was a perfectly good question from last time, we'll just carry on using it. So perhaps no harm in seeing this. The first is it's created and owned by the EU through the European Space Agency. And the orbital planes are different. In this case, there are three orbital planes, but there are 30 satellites. So 10 satellites in each orbital path, certainly a question on that. And the orbital height is higher than GPS, and that means the orbital period, period is slower. Now you might need some way of remembering these things. So I use a slightly xenophobic approach, and I say, well, because we're all good Europeans or were until, were until recently good Europeans, European technology is evidently superior. So the European satellites are the highest satellites up in orbit. And the Americans, they're good guys, but they're not quite as good, so they're slightly lower. And the old Soviet technology, lower still. And once you've got the arrangement, then you can figure out that the satellites that are orbiting closer to the Earth are orbiting faster. Extra bits and pieces. Those are the frequencies that Galileo operates on. Notionally, old syllabus guys needed to know all of this, practically not tested. The significant part of this is that the third frequency range, excuse me, <coughs> the third frequency range, 1559 to 1591, includes L1. Um, I don't suppose anybody remembers the frequencies for L1, do they? 1575, you probably forgot it when I said forget it. So this is why in the most basic systems, Galileo and GPS are interoperable because they operate in the same frequency ranges for starters. Now you wouldn't think that that would be a barrier for a modern receiver, but when you're going back 20 years or so, perhaps it was a barrier. Extra old syllabus stuff. Um, this is a classification from the, uh, the European Space Agency website. And it's basically just a statement. State that each satellite has three sections, the timing section, the signal generation section, and the transmission section. Fine, if you wanna classify your satellites, this is as good a way as any. 
Also questions about clocks. Each satellite, each Galileo satellite has two types of atomic clocks, so making four in all. There are two accurate but heavy passive hydrogen maser clocks, that's the big picture. And there are two lighter but less accurate or subject to different errors, rubidium clocks. And the idea is you put the rubidiums in because you don't want your satellite to be too heavy, but also being subject to different errors means that when you're averaging them out, then you can take account of that. And actually, the rubidiums are slightly less accurate. So if you take your four clocks and you worked out your satellite time, I don't think you would achieve that by adding all the times together and dividing by four. I think you'd have to put a bias in for the known greater accuracy of the hydrogen masers. So those hydrogen masers are referred to as the master clocks, just meaning they're more accurate, that's all. They're master clocks. And they are, of course, all regularly synchronized to the ground-based clocks, which happen to be cesium, which are even more accurate and even more heavy. There is one residual question in the old syllabus which has the wrong answer, and it's just, there's no way to answer it other than just ticking the one that you know to be right, in inverted commas. Uh, the right answer says each Galileo satellite has two clocks. It is not right in, in any absolute sense. It's right for the exam. What they mean is two types of clock. It actually has four clocks, but there's no four clock answer. So they, they must mean two types of clock. And that's the end of Galileo differences. And Beidou, well, Beidou only turns up in the modern syllabus, and you just need to say, yes, it's a GNSS system, nothing beyond that. So a bit summary of differences. In concept, the differences for the new syllabus, you just need to be able to name the systems and make those two statements. For the old syllabus, you might need deeper knowledge, specifically with Galileo and GLONASS. Anything, anything. Okay, so now we need to look at the derivatives, ABAS, SBAS, and stuff like that. We're going to start with a definition, which is differential GPS. What is it? So a, definite, a differential GPS system improves the accuracy of a raw data position fix using a system of fixed ground-based reference systems. So the concept is, I'm standing here in Bristol Ground School's international headquarters. I have a GPS receiver on my desk, and I know exactly what its position is in terms of uh, latitude, longitude, and height. I've surveyed the position. I've got theodolites out and all sorts of stuff. I know where it is. And a signal comes in from my GPS, and it says, actually, you're not here. You're actually here. So there is an error in the GPS position data. If I can detect what that error is, which is a three-dimensional vector about that big, and send it to any other receiver in the, lo in the local vicinity, then they can all update their positions to be mega accurate. That's what differential GPS is, one form or another. Now we have three BASs to look at. We have SBAS, GBAS, and ABAS. SBAS and GBAS do notionally improve the accuracy of the GPS fix. I say notionally because if you look at the raw accuracy, as we've already commented, it's already less than a meter, both horizontally and vertically. And SBAS and GBAS might gain you a few centimeters on that, but it's nothing really dramatic. It used to be dramatic. I mean, it, when these things were conceived 20 plus years ago, then we were going from an accuracy of 15 meters down to an accuracy of a meter. That was a significant increase. But nowadays, there is no, there's still a notional gain in accuracy, but it's not going to set the world on fire, but they're still counted as differential GPS systems. And our third BAS, ABAS, gives no improvement of accuracy at all. But what they all do is they all provide integrity control. And this is the big thing about these BAS systems, SBAS, GBAS, it's all about integrity control. And they're achieved in different ways. Sometimes the information gets to you from a satellite. Sometimes it comes from a VHF data broadcast. But it's all about integrity control, because ultimately it comes down to legal liability. I mean, let's suppose, for instance, that the CAA published a raw GPS approach to Heathrow. No monitoring at all. Just raw GPS. We rely on the American systems. And an Air Canada A340 comes down the GPS and it crashes. 
The next thing that's going to happen is three or four hundred very, very angry and aggressive Canadian lawyers are going to turn up at the CAA's headquarters and say, how did you legally publish that approach? What monitoring systems do you have in place? Because everything else has monitoring systems. ILSs have monitoring systems. NDBs have monitoring systems. VORs, do have, they will all check every system to, to see that it's delivering the right information. The same thing is true with GPS. It needs a monitoring system in place. So that's what this is all about, integrity control. And that's where we are, of course, nowadays with our EGNOS approaches into UK airfields. Yes, you can do it. You know, it's going to be as accurate as it always was. But what you don't have is the legal layer of integrity control. So if you crash, somebody's going to be in trouble. Integrity control. We'll take these in order. Satellite-based augmentation systems. There are four that we acknowledge, excuse me. <coughs> There's the Wide Area Augmentation System, which is American. There's EGNOS, which is the European Geostationary Navigation Overlay System. There's a Japanese system called MSAS, sometimes called MSBAS, but rarely. And there's an Indian system called GAGAN. You might be asked to identify these abbreviations. Long list of abbreviations. Which of the following are SBAS systems? Tick, 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 like that. Identify those. You might be asked to say what EGNOS stands for with four very plausible alternative answers. So you need to be able to say it's the European Geostationary Navigation Overlay System. Now, when we look at these on a map, what we discover is that they have coverage areas and the information is relayed to the aircraft from what they refer to as Inmarsat satellites, but are actually Inmarsat type satellites. So if we look at the American system there, it's called the Wide Area Augmentation System. And you can see the coverage area in pink and the transmission area of the geostationary satellites that sends the data down to them uh, with the satellite names. And there are three there. On the right, there's an Inmarsat satellite, Inmarsat 4F3. There's ANIC F1R. And the other satellite um, sounds more like a, like a Los Angeles porn channel than anything else. It's Galaxy 15. But those are the satellites that transmit the data down to the ground stations. So we could receive the data anywhere over the American continent, but it's only relevant in the coverage area because it's the coverage area that's monitoring, got all the monitoring ground stations and things in there. Moving across to the right, we've got our European system, EGNOS, three satellites there, an Inmarsat, an Artemis, and an Inmarsat. Moving across to the right, we've got the Indian system, with two geostationary Gagan satellites, and to the right of that, the Japanese METSATs there in their geostationary orbits. And these satellites change from time to time. This is a, a slide frozen in time, and they might switch the service from one geostationary satellite to another. So Inmarsat type satellites is, is pretty much what we'd be saying. And this is not an exhaustive diagram. There are other systems under development. For instance, Australia and New Zealand are coming up with a satellite-based augmentation system of their own. So how does it work? Well, the, the reason why it's called a satellite-based augmentation system is the information is sent, the update information is sent to the aircraft by satellite. So what we have here is a Boeing 737 over the cornfields of Iowa and it's receiving raw position information from all the other GPS satellites. And those are the, the red dotted arcs indicating raw position. And we already know that that raw position is pretty accurate, meter or something like that. Also receiving the GPS position all the way across the continental United States are loads of reference stations, ground monitor stations, if you like. And they're looking at the signals that are coming in and saying actually the range from this satellite is slightly out or the range from that satellite is slightly out and they're sending all their data to a master station and the master station is getting so much data in there that rather than just putting a single position vector out what it can do is it can give separate corrections for ephemeris error clock error and ionospheric error it works out what those separate collections are and it sends them to a ground earth station which transmits the data up to a geostationary satellite that we've just seen. And the geostationary satellite then sends that update information on these errors rather than a position vector to our aircraft. 
and our aircraft suitably equipped is able to make proper correction then for ionospheric error, clock error, and ephemeris error, those three things primarily. The geostationary satellite sends it to our receiver using a GPS type signal. And that has a side benefit. It means that if we're short of satellites, we can actually take a pseudo range on the geostationary satellite as well. In words then, consists of three elements. And you recognize the classification here is almost exactly the same as space segment, ground segment, control segment. Um, the only thing is, sorry, space segment, control segment, user segment. The only thing is they couldn't call the control segment the control segment because it doesn't actually control anything. So they just call it the ground infrastructure. So you've got the ground infrastructure on the ground. You've got the SBAS satellites, which are geostationary in Marsat type satellites. And you've got your specific enabled SBS airborne receivers. They provide separate corrections for ephemeris clock error and ionospheric error transmitted on the GPS frequency. <coughs> Can take pseudo range measurements on geostationary satellites and have the potential to provide approach procedure with vertical guidance. So SBAS approaches, APV SBAS, RNP approach to SBAS minima, however you choose to, to, to describe it. Um, and it says there, can do that. Questions on the concept. So in particular, EGNOS uses three Inmarsat satellites, and this is straight off the European Space Agency site, straight into your exam syllabus and questions, which broadcast GPS lookalike signals. And of course, it's out of date, the website, isn't it? It says it's accurate to one to two meters horizontally, three to five meters vertically. Well, those were the figures when the site was put up. Those are the figures that turn up in the exam, but they're not correct nowadays. If you look at the accuracy for EGNOS nowadays, it's, well, like I said, it's a few centimeters better than you get from the raw GPS, which in itself is less than a meter in both directions. Here's improves integrity and safety, they say very proudly, by alerting users within six seconds. That's tested. How long does it take? Within six seconds, if a GPS malfunction occurs, and it says they're up to three hours GPS alone. And what they're referring to there, of course, is the, is the medium term error correction of the GPS system, where a satellite flies over a monitor station, the error is detected, it's passed to the master control station, the error is computed, the correction is computed, it's passed to the uplink station, three hours, or up to three hours. So that in itself is becoming a bit ingenuous because you could achieve integrity control a different way. You could use something like RAIM. But the problem is then that the RAIM is not in control of the national authority that publishes the approach. So you can't rely on somebody else for integrity control. You can't rely on the aircraft. You can't rely on the other states. As a state, you've got to have your own integrity control. Or as an airfield, you've got to have your own integrity control. And because of this interoperability between GPS and Galileo, SBAS can use both sets of satellites. So that's SBAS in concept and EGNOS in particular. Anything? Now, this is not PBN lesson, but um, it is interesting perhaps to look at PBN type approaches. And here is an old slide because it shows an EGNOS approach at Exeter. And as a, a pilot for some distant past, I thought it was interesting to see how these are put together. Uh, this is not directly tested. This is just curiosity. So the first thing we've got here is we've got a five digit channel number. And you can see it perhaps just under the top there where it says RNAV EGNOS channel, blah, 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 blah. So what you'd do is you'd call this up by approach name from your database. So you'd say, I can't remember what it's called, but you want to do an RNAV GNSS runway 06 Exeter, and it would say, bing, up it comes. And the first thing you do is you check on your approach plate, electronic or, or, or paper, that the channel number is exactly the same. You can see there are various minima offered down the bottom. We'll come to those in just a second. Um, but look at the approach itself. These are very standardized approaches. When they design them, they try and design them according to a, a standard layout. And the standard layout is five mile sectors. So, and you can see there's three initial approach fixes there. Just check I've got my pen, my laser pointer here. There we go. Uh, so there's an initial approach fix there, initial approach fix there, initial approach fix there. 
which means you can come in from the north, from the west, from the south, and it'll feed you into this procedure. Look at the distances, five miles like that. It's all built to a sort of relatively standard uh, system. Um, approaches you can get, I'll go down the bottom and have a look at those. You can see the minima there. Um, in fact, I can do better than that. I've got it expanded up there. You can see the minima there. So uh, we've got an LNAV approach on the right-hand side. And you'll recall this uses satellite positioning laterally and uses a barometric input. Sorry, it uses, it's up to the pilots themselves to define the vertical path. So like a, an NDV approach, the pilots decide when to start the descent. They set up the rate of descent and stuff like that. And for category D aircraft, it says you can go down to 460 feet above aerodrome elevation there. In the middle, you've got an LNAV VNAV approach, RNP approach to LNAV VNAV minima. And you recall what this is. This is lateral guidance from the satellite system and a barometric input into the FMS or equivalent into the NAV system. And this will give you vertical guidance through the flight director and take you down to a lower minima, 380 feet. And finally, you've got LPV on the left-hand side, which is the equivalent of RNP approach to SBAS minima. This is full three-dimensional guidance from the satellite system. And for a category D aircraft, it will get you down to 256 feet. So you might say, well, what's the advantage of this then? What have we gained from this? And the answer would be, well, it isn't accuracy or decision heights, because if I was going to use an ILS, uh, Cat 1 ILS takes me down to 200 feet, and the best you can offer me here is 256 feet. A Cat 2 or Cat 3 would take me down either close to touchdown or to touchdown itself. So we're not getting better decision heights here. What we're getting here is better costs, because the cost of setting up this system requires no infrastructure at all from X to airport. They just need to come to an agreement with the European agency that gives them integrity control. In this case, how is the approach defined? Well, the approach is defined by a final approach segment data block that is pre-stored in the flight management system or the nav system, whatever you've got. So it's not being transmitted by anybody here. It's pre-stored in your system. That's a PBN approach. Anything on SBAS? Okay, the other BAS is GBAS. This is a local area system, and the essence of it is that rather than using satellites to send the data to the aircraft, we're just going to send it directly using a VHF data broadcast. A limited range given as um, 30 kilometers or 20 nautical miles, so very much a sort of local area system. And because it's a local area system, you don't get the errors split out into ionospheric delay, ephemeris error, clock error, and stuff like that. All that the ground monitor station can do here is say, I haven't, he hasn't quite worked out properly. I would expect a range of X from this satellite because I know exactly where I am. I know exactly where he is. I've got X plus 60 centimeters. So you get the, those little errors things. You don't know why they're errors. And it takes those errors and it sends them to the aircraft. There's a very odd new syllabus question that refers to the ground station as a pseudo light. Um, a pseudo light is something that pretends to be a transmitting GNSS satellite on the ground. So in other words, you can take ranges from it. And, and it just isn't. It's not that. It's a monitor station that eventually will output a VHF data broadcast. But there's no other way of answering that question other than assuming that they've just misnamed it. They can be connected, it says, to make a ground regional augmentation system. And there was a plan to do this. The German airfields were all going to be connected together with all their GBASs. And then along came EGNOS, and they said, uh, what is the point of that? And so they didn't bother doing it because EGNOS achieved the same thing. And what does it provide? Well, it provides approach data for all installed approaches. And what it means there is installed approaches at the airfield. So if you're going to somewhere like Malaga, then it's going to give you the approach data for all of the Malaga approaches that use GBAS. In other words, it's going to provide you with the final approach segments as part of the VHF data broadcast. So significant difference. <coughs> with GBAS, the final approach segment data block comes through the broadcast. With SBAS, it's part of your nav information loaded into your FMS. And it provides two services. It provides a local area service, which basically just updates your position in the vicinity of the airfield. 
and it provides a precision approach service. What is the precision approach service? Uh, what's the positioning service? Updates to local area services. Um, and the idea that it can update your position in the local area means that GBAS positioning service is a little bit more than ILS. If you do an ILS approach, you can fly a very precise approach. What can you do more with GBAS? Well, you can have an updated and accurate position in the local area off the approach path itself. And we need to note the American version is called the local area augmentation system. Precision approaches, there's a coverage area. Um, and wouldn't you bet that the coverage area looks like the ILS localizer coverage area, but isn't quite the same. So there it is, um, ILS localizer coverage area that would be 10 degrees either side out to 25 miles. This is 10 degrees either side out to 20 miles. And the localizer would be 35 degrees either side out to 17 miles. This is 35 degrees either side out to 15 miles. And you can't start a GBAS approach unless you're in that coverage area. What do they look like? Well, there's a really aggressive GBAS approach at Moses Lake in Washington. Um, and what that shows is an aircraft coming across the threshold at right angles to the threshold and doing a continuous descent, continuous turning descent into the airfield. That would definitely require flight directors to be able to follow a path like that. It'd be very, very hard to do, stroke impossible, uh, using HSIs and stuff. You'd need flight directors for that. What about minima? Well, there's our minima strip expanded at the bottom. And we've got, actually, we've got some RNP stuff there as well. We've got um, LNAV, VNAV uh, R, with an RNP capability of 0.3 gives you this minima. In the middle column, LNAV, VNAV with an RNP capability of 0.1 gives you that minima. On the left-hand side, it says GLS 200 feet. GLS is not a PBN approach. You can fly a GLS approach even if you don't have a PBN ticket on your instrument rating. And it's interesting to note that the minima you get from GLS from GBAS is lower than you get from SBAS, precise local area information. So we've done SBAS, we've got GBAS. Any questions on SBAS and GBAS? Our final BAS, ABAS, is said to consider uh, redundant elements within the GPS constellation is the phrase. Well, actually, that's RAIM. So RAIM is a subset of ABAS. It provides integrity control. Or the combination of GNSS measurements with those of other nav sensors, such as barometric altitude, inertial systems, and clock. Well, hang on a minute. That's how flight management computers navigate. This is what they call AAIM. So the two subsets of ABAS are RAIM, and airborne autonomous integrity monitoring, which is basically just how an FMC operates. And there has been a question which asked about that and says, let's suppose you had a mess up with your inertial nav system and you had to select it to attitude, so you've lost all of your INS system, what would be left? And the answer would be barometric altitude, clock, and GPS would still be left. RAIM would still be left. And this is not differential. This is to develop integrity control. Neither element of ABAS improves fixing accuracy. And so that's ABAS. And to my mind, that's the most difficult of the acronyms, SBAS, GBAS. But ABAS, you've got to think of two other acronyms that are subsets of it, RAIM, and the most difficult of all of them, AAIM, Airborne Autonomous Integrity Monitoring. And that brings us juddering and screeching to the end of this session on satellite navigation. So does anybody have any questions or do you have any comments that you'd like to include on this? Anything at all? Okay, well, in that case, I'm gonna wind it up. So thank you very much for attending. And um, there's another one actually not on satellites to, uh, tomorrow. I'm gonna to do one on DME tomorrow, which is something that people very rarely do. But if you wanna come along, we're doing the same time tomorrow, DMEs.